Okay, so uh, let's get let's get going. Um, we've changed the title very slightly, as you'll see from here, and um, the paper we present today is a sort of combination of some work I've, some research I've done on uh, in the past on ancient trade routes, modeling and their role in social change, uh, and a monograph that I've been uh, preparing together with the uh, other people on this list here, one of whom is here as well, Adam, the others uh, send their apologies. Uh, and this monograph is uh, exploring the relationship between ancient economics and archaeology and trying to update the relationship a little bit. And one of the things we noticed as we were doing this, and in fact one of the things we weren't in a way able to solve, um, was that archaeological theory, I mean archaeologists generally seem to have a great difficulty in integrating theories uh, of mechanisms of trade uh, with theories of changing inequality, uh, of social evolution, and uh, we think that this goes back uh, actually to Charles uh, original conception of the urban revolution. So in this presentation uh, we want to argue basically three main things. Um, that archaeological theories have tended to link trade with inequality because trades assumed association with urban societies. In the light of recent updated information on our understandings about urbanism, we can see that cities and inequality uh, actually have different origins, as it were, and so we can start to think about whether the same is also true for trade. And one of the reasons trade has been linked so strongly to inequality is we think that at certain points in history, elites do indeed uh, co-opt and monopolise trade networks, or at least try to, uh, and in a sense we're pre-programmed to fall for their rhetoric in these, so we've kind of uh, gone um, hook and sinker in with this. So we'll try and flesh this out for the rest of the talk. So if you want to drift off now, these are the three main points. This is a take home. So uh, there you go. Now, before going any further, and since this is tag, um, we need to clarify some terms and scope. So first, trade. Now, it's important to be clear what we mean when we use this term, because often trade is sort of elided with exchange more generally in the archaeological literature especially in prehistory, so in the periods when urbanism uh, first appears. And this is obviously a result of the fact that often from the travel eye perspective it's quite difficult to differentiate different mechanisms. So here we use trade to mean something quite specific, and that's the exchange of goods or services across political uh, or cultural and particularly sovereign boundaries. Second is inequality. Um, now, recent scholarship has created a kind of inequality turn within archaeology, and that's from issues of gender and race in the past and present, uh, to deep time derivation of Gini coefficients from things like house sizes, which are used to model wealth and power inequality. So here we're going to concentrate just on inequality in terms of the wealth power nexus, uh, which we might also call sort of traditionally social stratification. But we want to just say here that, that although there are actually many different axes along which inequality can be, can be perceived. Um, and the sort of linear inequality we typically imagine when we're discussing social stratification may be uh, rather anachronistic. Finally, urbanism. So we concur with many of the perspectives, um, I mean, presented in this session as well, um, but seen elsewhere which sort of highlight the sort of tangled gymnastics uh, that we've got ourselves into um, trying to talk about the nature of urbanism and the requirement that cities display stratification. And we see clear evidence um, that cities in the sense of large-scale agglomerations of people, and perhaps that's all early cities, whether along the Dnieper, uh, Euphrates, Indus or Niger, were actually places of relative low inequality uh, and high growth. And instead, we would argue that serious archaeological, archaeologically visible uh, stratification arose first in places we would call citadels, in the sense of densified agglomerations of hierarchical power. And these were created from low growth economic dynamics. And it's only later did some cities get citadelized, um, but it's this citadelized version of the city that Child bequeathed us in his characterization of the urban revolution. Okay, so let's begin properly where all good archaeological theory should begin with Gordon Child. And trade and social stratification were both part of Child's urban revolution trait list. But actually, interestingly, he didn't talk an awful lot about trade. Um, he spent no time exploring how trade related to wider economic or political dynamics. Um, and as Andrew Sherrett pointed out, Child was 
suspicious of luxuries and in fact discounted the importance of long distance exchange of what we now call uh, prestige goods, evidence for which subsequent archaeologists have placed a great deal of focus. Now, despite our recognition of this blind spot, a, a bifurcation um, was nonetheless inherited in ancient economics. And I think this also comes from you know, the influence of Polanyi and so on, in which pre-urban societies had exchange and urban societies have trade. Now, unlike Charles' urban revolution, world systems uh, remains one of the few theoretical frameworks uh, within archaeology that is engaged in the relationship directly between trade and inequality. Departing from Wallerstein's original uh, restriction to the last few hundred years, uh, archaeological proponents of this approach attempted to focus on uh, the way that uh, structural asymmetries in the types of trade and materials established economic de dependencies uh, between cores and peripheries, but also change those places in the process. Um, and they address two forms of inequality. First, what we might call sort of modern economists would call national or local inequality, but also uh, uh, the second, which is the sort of what is, might be called global inequality, which is differences in wealth and power uh, between regions. So one of the most important insights from world systems is to explain the resource curse. And the resource curse is used to designate the phenomena uh, where regions with considerable sources of what are considered valuable materials, metals or oils, do not tend to gain the economic benefits of these resources. So world systems proponents argue that the control of labor within the core, usually through institutionalized social hierarchy, facilitates manufactured products which have a globally more value than the raw materials which they are, for which they are exchanged. Now, in the case of ancient Eurasia, uh, actors in uh, core regions, so Mesopotamia, sought access to exotic and desirable raw materials, precious stones, metals, in uh, resource-rich neighbors, so highland Anatolia, Iran, and so on, uh, in exchange for products with added value. So it's Mesopotamia, in particular its elites, uh, who benefited most from this economic development. And this obviously reverses the, the sort of simple proximity argument that resources are the main predictor of wealth. In world systems, uh, international trade uh, managed out of cities in the core is therefore a catalyst of both local and global inequality in both core and peripheries. So all of this makes a good deal of sense when we assume that early cities were stratified but it starts to unravel uh, with the hindsight of the new evidence that's coming out, a new understanding about urban forms, many of which seem to have had very uh, little discernible wealth inequality. So let's take uh, an important counterexample to the association of cities and inequality. Adam, who's here, uh, has argued that uh, there is nothing to show the existence of elite control or differentiation in the uh, Bronze Age Indus civilization, whatever localized social status differences within families and so on. There's, there's no sort of larger scale inequality to be spotted, no iconography of gods or rulers even. But Indus cities were clearly able to procure materials from and export to outside the Indus zone, uh, precious uh, stones particularly, and uh, work stone objects in the other direction. Um, and there's also evidence for a shared metrological system of balance weights, which clearly demonstrate a concern uh, with trade type exchange beyond local political boundaries. So trade was present in intercities without substantial inequality. And even in Mesopotamia, uh, the latest research strongly hints, I think, that um, the very earliest phases of cities have little evidence which would, would demonstrate stratification. Nonetheless, materials sourced via long distance exchange are clearly present from long into Mesopotamian history uh, from the, and, and from the earliest uh, city levels. Now, undeniable trade is evident from the third millennium onwards, as documented by the presence of increased, increasing imported materials, and as time goes by, uh, descriptions of trade in texts 
and of course the presence, uh, like in the Indus, uh, of uh, systems of weight metrology. And to look in the other direction again, as we saw earlier, the uh, fourth millennium Trapelia sites uh, of the Bhagnipa River interflues seem to have had rather little in the way of inequality, or this, some perhaps systematic import of materials, despite the organization of very large numbers of people. So we have urbanism, uh, we have cities rather, uh, we don't have inequality, but we do seem to have some trade. In Bronze Age uh, Central and Northern Europe, we have considerable evidence for prestige goods circulating. Um, in some cases associated what we think of elite burials. Also in some cases, evidence of balance weighing, at least since the early uh, second millennium BC. So here we have trade and perhaps some inequality, but without the kind of um, high scale demic agglomerations that we're seeing elsewhere. So the conclusion is that we really need to start to decouple these different things and not assume that they all go together. Now this leaves us with the question, uh, why the link between trade and inequality has remained so strong in archaeological theory. Now, outside archaeology there are different reasons why um, sort of discussions of trade and inequality um, might have um, cohered, but within archaeology we think this goes again back to the era of Child's originally, uh, original uh, revolutionary narrative. So, Child's time-compressed understanding of the first city, if you have to remember when he was writing, was based um, on the still nascent evidence that was coming out uh, from Mesopotamia in the 1930s to 50s. And we know now, of course, the chronology is much longer, uh, and most of the dynastic features uh, that uh, we see here um, relate to a relatively late period in Mesopotamian history, relatively late in relation to the creation of cities. And at this point, stratified societies were clearly present. Elites had indeed co-opted and monopolized trade networks, at least to some degree. So early dynastic Mesopotamia saw the rise of citadelized cities with stratification built on top of pre-existing systems of population aggregation, trade and governance. Um, Mesopotamian text, especially uh, from the later third millennium, particularly from the Akkadian period onwards, contain the assertions of kings and rulers and their ancestors uh, who claimed that they created wage systems, that they opened trade routes, and they built the city walls. But archaeological evidence shows us that many of these things were in place long before uh, the existence of kings, as far as we can tell. So general, Charles generalizing from the compressed Mesopotamian history turned out to be misleading because as a field it meant that archaeologists have fallen into the trap of what we've called uh, elite determinism. And this is the idea uh, that political economic elites were driving force of change and innovation simply because they said they were. And elite determination, uh, determinism sorry, continues in the modern day with our unhealthy management obsession with entrepreneurialism, uh, which for a large part sim simply justifies an extraordinary growth in inequality at precisely the time when generalized growth in the economy is at an all-time low. So this is something we clearly saw during the pandemic, of course. Okay, so to conclude, just to reiterate our main points, um, archeological theories have tended to link trade with inequality because of trade's assumed association only with urban societies. And in the light of our new understanding, we can see that cities and inequalities have different origins, so the same may be true for trade. However, trade was linked to inequality because elites always tried to co-opt and monopolize trade networks, as is their purpose, um, but, more, but the, the, their propaganda often outlives the immediate achievements or their lack of achievements of these aims. So we've fallen into their spell. So this leaves us with future directions. And armed with our revolutionary new evidence about urbanism, we really need to evolve our theories uh, to better integrate these different mechanisms, the different mechanisms of uh, economic growth, of inequality, of trade and social organization. So thank you very much.